So welcome everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Hensch, I'm the director of the, the Siegel Center. We are still in the beginning um, of our season after the uh, film festival. And uh, tonight, uh, at least in my book, we have a very significant and important event and I think it's really worse at the start of our um, presentations. Um, as you know, we all uh, are, um, have the highest respect of the work of Heiner Müller, who I also personally knew and, uh, and encountered in my days at the Gießen uh, Theatre School in Germany, and it's the year of his 90th birthday. And um, we had uh, many talks how to celebrate that well, and Antje Ögel, who is a collaborator of the Siegel, actually worked here also as an assistant for the director of program, um, was instrumental in creating the idea, which we did to really um, celebrate it in a way as a close uh, uh, family. Connection. So we have with us uh, Brigitte Maria Meyer, his wife, and Anna Müller, the daughter of Anna Müller and Brigitte. And if this would be in Berlin, there would be like a thousand people. It would be at the Volksbühne. People couldn't get in. <laughs> and um, but uh, uh, I think it is. A, we want to thank you to come to New York and uh, to really uh, share also the uh, your experiences, your work, your your life with Heiner and to give us an insight uh, in, his, uh, in his work and how you see it also now at the moment, uh, so many years um, later after his death. So um, we are um, uh, presenting this evening uh, in the following way. It will be a reading, short reading of Hannah Müller's speech at the Mühlhammer Theatertage in 79. Uh, and Anna will read that. He, she is a young publisher in Berlin, but also uh, acted in films by Brigitte and um, is of course, clo of course, close uh, to the uh, world of this. At the moment, there is a play by um, Fritz Carter at the Berliner Ensemble called Heiner One to Four. It's a very successful uh, uh, work. It's it, it's a dialogue, a work, a collage. Uh, I think very much close uh, also to the work of Heiner Müller in a sense how he worked. And we're going to hear a little excerpt of it. I was supposed to see it on Saturday. I was there for the funeral of the great Andrzej Wirt, who was my professor of theater. I just also want to mention him. He was the one who invited Heiner Müller to come to Gießen and changed, I think, uh, a lot also through that, uh, through that work, uh, what he did there at the Gießen University. Um, and um, both Anna and uh, Brigitte will read uh, from the work. After that, uh, Brigitte will give a, a presentation on the universe, a little presentation on the universe of Heiner Müller, the way she sees his work, what is significant. And uh, I think this is a very uh, significant and important uh, uh, talk which we will going to experience. After that, and I'm so honored to have them with us here, we have uh, Bonnie Maranka from PJ Magazine and Jonathan Kalb, uh, our colleague from Hunter College who booked the first books also in America about Heiner Müller and Bonnie who is his publisher uh, and also knew him and has the Hamlet machine uh, within her work of publications. Um, so they will join us and we will just talk a bit about the presentations, what we did and then open up to a Q&A where we have um, a lot of time for, and then followed by a little um, discussion, a little drink afterwards. So um, I think again, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you really for coming. This is a very significant event. Here's the work of Heidern Müller is central um, to modern theater and um, of post-modern theater uh, and post-traumatic theater, as one could say, in the sense of Hans Lehmann, their works by Wilson, Heidern Müller, and the Muster Group, and, who are really uh, changed the way theater was done before and after, especially with the Hamlet machine. So this is a truly significant um, um, evening and we want to get an insight we really uh, would normally not get. So again, thank you all for coming and taking time out on the Monday evening here in New York, one of the first warm days. And um, if you have a cell phone, so just take it out for the moment and um, make sure it is off. Oops, I'm getting a call this moment, but I think it is off. And um, <laughs> the evening will also be live streamed. So uh, for the Q&A, we will give you uh, also a microphone so we can um, hear it better. Again, thank you all uh, for coming. And um, Anna. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, let me start with the Mina speech from 1979. I regret that I cannot be present at this event, the more so since one of my works is the occasion for this year's gathering. The rehearsals for the premiere of an older play are at a point where my participation is needed more than usual. And besides that, I have started work on a new play. In this situation, my appearance in Mülheim would cost me more than just two days of work. I therefore ask your understanding for my decision to forego this. 
The wish to hear something from me about the theater of today causes me some embarrassment. The reality of the drama of theater is always the present. And in the present situation, to name examples of more or less equal value, Hamlet is more relevant to me than Godot, Weinstein more important than Mother Courage. I am talking about plays, not authors. I am still and repeatedly more interested in Brecht's Fazza fragment than in Shakespeare's Winter's Tale. That the classical texts still work has to do with their reservoir of utopia, that they cannot be written anymore, or once again cannot be written with the endangerment or disappearance of utopia. The subject of more recent drama is a human race that is, whether already or still as a question of one's political standpoint, reduced. Many of the best minds and huge industries are now working to make humanity disappear. Consumerism is training of the masses in this process. Every consumer product and weapon, every supermarket a training camp. This sheds light on the necessity of art as a means to make reality impossible. The gravitational mass of the people and a capitalism requirement for politics is its corrective in a socialist society, the blindness of experience, the bashing of its authenticity. The media's cliches about dissidence and or dogmatism miss the reality. Reality does not live in the extremes. What is history for the elites has always still been work for the masses. The cliches serve the appetite for signals of betrayal sent to capitalism from the opposing camp. They guarantee the good conscience of consumption, the freedom of corruption. Only the increasing pressure of authentic experience develops the capacity to look history in the wide of its eye. The space-time of art is between the time of the subject and the time of history, the difference of potential theater of war. My difficulty in dealing with dramatic productions in your other German state lies in my post-war dry experience with another subject and another history. The black drama in the US is less foreign to me than the capitalist place of mourning of Otto Strauss, in which history appears only in its absence, as a void, or as the movement of capital, which is invisible to the eye. Anxiety about the standard of living as religious experience. Thomas Bernhardt's black humor, which in recent times is handled like dynamite by sensitive critics, who fill them with their private sadness, remain a series of grimly affirmative jokes as long as theatrical market forces drive all the mourning out of the texts. My solidarity belongs to Franz Xaver Kress and his heroic attempt to uphold communism as the middle way in the political vacuum that is the center of your world, although my experience shows it to be more like its other. In both German states, drama is a wider field than the theaters are prepared or in a position to explore. An institution like the Munich Theater Days is all the more to be welcomed, since it at least makes possible the illusion that in the Federal Republic too there is a broader interest in the production of contemporary drama in the German language. On the whole, writing plays has once more become a lonely business. Idle discussions have turned the theories gray, which can only be changed by politics and not without the political contribution of art. Since Fatsos walk around the city of Mülheim, which reflects in angry sentences on the connection between war and business, it is likely that property relations have changed much in Munich. To this extent, the playwriting price is something like an indulgence. My hope is a world in which works like Germania, Death in Berlin, can no longer be written, because reality no longer provides the material for them. In this sense, I thank the city of Munich. So there is uh, that piece of Fritz Carter, the play, Heiner 1 to 4. And uh, so there's an undertitle, and it's like angels flying. And so inspired by angels. So, and that piece, I think, is so Amin Petras, which is Fritz Carter. So, he was looking for the biography of Heiner and also looking for his own biography, I guess, in when he wrote that.
place. So we have just the play has three parts, and the first part is a young couple watching a photo book. And that photo book is a book which I did ten years after Heiner's death. And it's Polaroid, which we did from each other. So from day one, we started to take pictures of each other. It, sh it just happened, yeah? So, and so when Heimer died, so I had like hundreds of the Polaroids, even more, and they were all in that cigar boxes. It's not from them. We put them all in that wooden boxes. And for 10 years, I just put them off. In a, in a, in a, so I, I didn't watch them, never. So then I don't know, one day it just came by chance that I opened it and then I met that book. So, and that was, that book was the inspiration for uh, Armin to do like that first part. So it's a young couple watching that book. And so they try to fill in the persons they see. So the second one is a kind of a fictive interview with Heiner, but is a collage of all the interviews, quotes of his interviews he did. So we have to say that the interviews for him was a kind of an expression. So maybe he would Twitter today. So, mm -hmm. But in that time, he gave interviews nearly every day. It was just a way also to keep his voice in the new Germany. And the third part is like um, is like the melting of the author with his object. So and and really, so he tries to go into into the body, into the soul of Heiner. So what we read now, Anna and me, is um, from part two, from the interview part. So, Mr. Müller, how was Theatre created? Well, it hadn't rained in a long time. And so a goddess went into the cave and did striptease. And the other god saw this and started to laugh, to laugh loudly, and then it started to rain again. Yeah, so that's how that story. And then another story was added at some point so that you can memorize the feelings better. You are directing in Bayreuth and at the Deutsches Theater. And recently you became president of the Academy of the Arts. When do you write your next play? No idea. Schiller didn't write a play for seven years once. So what? In your work, it is often said that life is a slaughterhouse, and only the biggest slaughterers and schemers are successful in the battle for survival. That can only change if the model on which the world is built is changed. Nice summary. At some point I noticed that I'm writing something for which there's no stage anymore, or not yet, for me. What happens right now started with Stalingrad. It is way more interesting for me to write about Stalingrad than about the fall of the wall. What looks so spectacular right now is in the end only a result of erosions and changes that happened underground a long time ago. I once met a black man from California who was in Berlin on a scholarship and was about to write a novel and he said, the fact I'm here is due to Hitler. History is always moving in mysterious ways. You never know what the outcome is. The immediate result is usually not the final result. There's no dramatic subject on the surface. You have to dig deeper. I am bored by democracy. As a writer, one is affected by a basic experience. And that happened for the most part before puberty. My basic experience was the fascist dictatorship, the state as a violent force. I have often reflected upon it later when I went from East Berlin, Friedrichstraße, to, to Zoologischer Garten with my privileged passport. That was like an emerging from a deep water with high pressure into shallow water. The pressure was released and then you get dive as par par paralysis and you start getting dizzy. I always had the feeling when I was in the Western countries that what was happening there is actually not my problem. When I came back living Friedrichstraße, I felt this other body, this knot, that's dark, 
the hard work that's ineffective that made this body. The heaters, the steel workers, the washing woman, the soldiers and their fellow poles. Of course, this was a productive situation for a planet. The core of it is, of course, Jenny's view. To be happy about every lack, about every broken bit of the world. In a harmonical world, one doesn't need to work. Art has something cannibalistic. Art isn't necessarily something good or humane. Perhaps at some point there will be a society that doesn't need art anymore. A humane society, but at the moment, it is still needed. I still need it. Why art? That's not my question. <coughs> I can get by well with what there is right now. I am not dependent on anyone having anything against me anymore. Right now, it is all about writing what I've always wanted to write in the time that I've left. What is going on with Stalingrad? Is this an obsession of yours? That was a purgatory of capitalism together with Auschwitz. Since then, they can do whatever they want. There are no limits anymore. The limits is overrun. The purgatory is a car wash. Everything that's coming doesn't look so bad. It's somehow cute. You can put it in the opera and sell it again. That's why the opera is so crowded. The daily grind and the band can't be so bad when the night with Mozart is so pretty. So it's the fall of the war, the liquidation of the victory of Stalingrad for you? I don't believe in victories anymore. The victory is always the end. Nothing is harder than to come to terms with a victory. Everything remains in status quo for a short time only, and then it keeps turning. The closure of Stalingrad was the model for the Eastern Bloc. Confinement from the outside and destruction on the inside. Perhaps Stalingrad was already the end of the Soviet dream, or better, his ice box. At the moment, it is about preventing future. That's the principle of capitalism that is based on competition and not on the social relations that have grown. The social in capitalism did only come about because of communism. The fear of Stalinism gave the units their strength. Now, the enemy is gone and capitalism can be shaped more in social. That will happen on the map. You can't stop the war of immigration except with walls, but they won't help long. Why are there so many angels in your story? You need angels when all looks bleak and there's no more. Um, yeah, thanks again for having us here. And uh, so that is my first PowerPoint presentation in 54 years. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so let's start, yeah? Heil Macbeth, König von Schottland! Singer. 
Was er besungen hatte, konnte seine Haut nicht ritzen. Bauern, durch den Jagdlärm aufgeschreckt, rannten von ihren Flügen weg, für die kein Platz gewesen war in seinem Lied. So war sein Platz unter den Flügen. So, this impressive Macbeth production in the adaption from Heiner is directed by Michael Thalheimer and we can currently see it at the Berliner Ensemble. Orpheus Gepflügt is part of an interview with Alexander Kluge recorded 1992, uh, one day before Anna's birth, you see me there. So. And if you are interested, or I think most of you will know it, that all these interviews you can have on the Cornell University website. So it's really always nice to look at them. So why those two works? So what I really like is that Heiner is rewriting historic and mythological material by adding an unseen class, an undescribed class. So, and, and there's also something which like my work and Heiner's work or what we had in common that was kind of work on myth. And so that was something, that was a common room we had which we could live in together. And also uh, the painting of Renaissance, so we traveled a lot in Italy. That was also big inspiration for us. Heiner and I, we met at the Frankfurt Book Fair uh, 1990, so nearly one year after the fall of the wall. And so, and he gave me that little note at the, uh, in Frankfurt just to find him, to find his home in Berlin. So, which became then also um, my new home. And um, like I already said, we were from the beginning, we took photos of each other, sometimes also like selfies, what we call it today. <laughs> and uh, always with a Polaroid camera. And uh, I already told you, it came out a book, which is called Der Tod ist ein Irrtum, so death is an error, uh, at Surkamp Verlag. So, um, yeah, and so that was the first poem I became from him. And um, yeah, so and more and more I learned more about him. I mean, so what country he came from and what he had lost. So and what he first lost is his writer's room. So the historic condition for his dramatic work. And the end of his country and the end of this writer's room he had already foreseen uh, in his place. Aus dem Schutz der Freiheit wird der Streit nach dem Sturz der Regierung. Wir dürfen uns nicht mehr organisieren lassen. Man beginnt die Polizisten zu entwaffnen. Wir müssen uns selbst organisieren. Stürmt zwei, drei Gebäude. Die Preise werden steigen, die Löhne kaum. Ein Gefängnis, eine Polizeistation, ein Büro der Geheimpolizei. Die Daumenschrauben sollen angezogen werden. Er hängt ein Dutzend Handlanger der Macht an den Füßen auf. Die nächsten Jahre werden für uns keinen Zucker schlecken. Die Regierung setzt Truppen ein, Panzer. So, what we see uh, is Heiner on 1989 on the Alexanderplatz. So, where it was like a euphoric um, atmosphere, so, and uh, people really disgusted what he said, so he, or people said like, boo, and don't say that now, so, and, uh, and I like that collage with uh, Hamlet Machine, and so Hamlet, Hamlet Machine was then the first play for me to see from him and directed by him in Deutsches Theater, and uh, so, I came there and I've never seen something like that. So there was such a crowd of people running into the theater that evening that the staff lost control and hundreds of people swarmed into the theater hall 
taking over every square meter they could get. So the atmosphere was highly charged and the first time Hamlet's line, the time was out of joint, made sense to me. So never again I experienced a moment like that later in theater or in art that like is like a, a theater play and a historic situation is, is going in one, in one thing. So that the, the time, the historic time breaks in into the play. That was really um, a thankful experience for me. So, and um, so the 1989 revolution is a, is a revolution that ended prema prema prematurely as the Western system took over very fast. So the revolution in the East never made it beyond the round tables. And there's a quote by Heiner which explains exactly that. It's not a problem of content, it's a problem of velocity. Heiner tried to save what he could. He became head of the Academy of Arts East and prevented its liquidation. He established an early form of social media by giving interviews, commenting on the political situation every day. And he became head of the Berliner Ensemble, trying to preserve room for non-commercial art and trying to transfer to express the new political situation. So unfortunately, there's no video material as the Berliner Ensemble was not able to provide it. I'm sorry, so, but I have some photos only for you. So that is the first production he did there, Duell, Traktor Fatzer, it was like a collage. And um, so, and it was all about a failing revolution. So, and uh, the critics were not at all amused as Duell Traktor Fatzer put disillusionment with the flowering landscape of United Germany on stage. So, and then already like the best time in the Berliner Ensemble from the atmosphere was finished. So then he did quartet later on with Marianne Hopper and later on Arturi Ui, but that were already uh, calculated successes. And yeah, what I already said, like that euphoric atmosphere from the beginning was very soon gone. So, but there were, let's say, other things happening, so, and um, yeah, Heiner got father, so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he started to write again, so. And uh, mainly poems then in that time, and, but awaiting the new play. So that was always like every day, when can I write my new play? But it still took a bit time, so. And that is uh, a poem he wrote for Anna, which is also part of the play of Fritz Carter. So you can see it here in a manuscript of him. And along the way, he, revolution he revolutionized opera with a century staging of Tristan and Isolde, which became iconic and ran for eight years in Bayreuth and was resumed last year at Opera Lyon. He transformed Tristan and Isolde into a bright, perfect abstraction where maybe the romance between Tristan and Isolde is the least important relationship of the play. So we, we see now part three, uh, a little piece of part three of the opera and uh, which um, in, a, in a destroyed, room of the war.
<laughs> so, um, but it was like that opera in Beirut, it was something, one of the really, really uh, things we did every year. So every summer we went to Beirut because so it, 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 it's called like a Werkstatt, like a working work on progress. And so the directors come every year to their stagings and uh, change little things or like go on with the work. So, and that was really always an important time. So, 1994, Heiner was diagnosed with cancer and uh, in a serious operation which saved his life, but it saved it only for one more year. So to recover, we spent three months in California at the Villa Aurora, where he finally was able to write a new play called Germania Three Ghosts at Dead Man, a rough ride through German history. So. We see us here like in an adoption of Las Meninas, the family, and with <laughs> Betty Freeman, with little Anna, and with Peter Sellers, me in the mirror, and Heiner. And uh, yeah, so, and so before he was then supposed to premiere the play himself at the Berliner Ensemble, Heiner died the 30th of December, 1995, so, um, yeah. Leander Hausmann premiered the play in Bochum as a childlike German comic. Surely one option, but for me the real premiere of Germania III, I experienced last year in Lyon, the opera composed by Alexander Raskatov, from which I show you the Hitler monologue now.
I just show you another highlight from the last year, which was Dimitar Gottschew's staging of cement at Residenz Theater Munich, which is still in the repertoire there. And we watch a rehearsal scene where Dimitar himself cheers on the actors to build the new cement factory. At the moment, in Germany, we have uh, regular stagings, mostly at smaller houses, and uh, if it's the big house, it's mostly a Shakespeare adaption. And uh, so, but uh, three days ago, uh, there was a premiere in Deutsches Theater with one of his early plays, which are rarely played, and Die Umsiedlerin, and uh, so, t as the critics, I got sent that morning, it was successful, but we haven't seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to see it. And uh, so, what else do we do at the moment? So we plan, um, so we plan a new edition now with Surkamp, and it's an edition with the plays and the manuscripts, a kind of manuscript edition, because so the manuscripts of Heine are highly interesting because so very often they really look like paintings, art pieces, so he was writing a lot and, and designing a lot of it. And for this, um, we bring together in May all from Müller experts from all over Germany. So, and to start that new edition that is supposed then hopefully to be ready for his uh, 100th birthday, 2029. So, what is else on the stages? So, it's, mm, it's not that it's more or less, it's mostly so in the last year it was like, man frequently so but uh, what I see at the moment is like a bigger interest also on the actor schools and the director schools so and we have we have contact with some young actors and directors from Ernst Busch for example and they have a little group now where they just play or just staging uh, plays of Heiner and um, and it's for me it's nice to have that contact like with people who I can say never met him and but just live in his works so and and we really enjoy and appreciate that contacts and uh, sometimes we give them the chance in my uh, studio to make a little staging there and bring people together so that's what's running at the moment. And, and last but not least, I show you an um, art piece of mine, a video installation, um, where Anna is, is a video installation is after Anatomy Tito's Fall of Rome. And as I don't have the trailer in English, so I just show you the intro, and the intro is a piece also of Germania III. It's a Krimhild monologue, and it's spoken by Anna, and then it starts um, Anatomy to Titus Fall of Rome. So. Ihr habt mein Fleisch gegessen und mein Blut getrunken, durch zehn Länder mich gejagt, in dieser Hochzeit meinen anderen Tod und meine Haut gespannt auf eure Trommel. Seid meine Gäste jetzt, zur letzten Mahlzeit. Esst eure Toten und löscht euren Durst mit ihrem Blut. Der Tisch wird reich gedeckt sein und feiert eure Hochzeit mit dem Nichts. 
dass eure Wohnung ist im Reich der Toten. Wüstet Rom, die Hauptstadt der Welt. Okay. First. So first of all, again, thank you for coming um, all the way over from Berlin. They uh, joined us and they came to New York on Tuesday and I think had some meetings and walk. They met with uh, Tony Kushner and Toshi Z and many others. Um, First, how does it feel to be in New York? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it feels very good. Is it? Okay, I'm trying. Okay. Yeah. 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 It feels very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it feels very good. So, because uh, it's such a long time that I have been here, and uh, yeah, it's about like twelve years or something, and. Um, and I really enjoy New York, and it's so I, I forgot how how I loved it in a way, and but it changed a lot for sure in that years, and I really love a lot the hood where we live in Chinatown, which is really nice. It reminds me on Kreuzberg twenty years ago <laughs> in Berlin. So, and uh, yeah, I mean it's the next gentrification, I guess. So, but uh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's such a different feeling. So it's so, in a, in a way, it's for sure it's more rough here, but in a way it's also a bigger space. It's more open. Yeah, they have like people from all nations here. And uh, so, and I really miss that in, in Berlin sometimes. Yeah, I would wish like to see more people like that, like here in Berlin. No. 
that the situation is open like here. So. Um, so preparing for the evening, the 90th birthday of Heiner Müller, which would have been uh, what? 9th of January. The 9th. Um, um, so um, how do you look at the, his work now with some distance also uh, from it? Has it changed? Is it the same? or? Um, Okay, I think that is, an, uh, so he's a kind of a chronist of the ideological systems of the 20th century. So, and, uh, and, he, and just also, if you see the language, so the language is like, uh, oh, Bob Robert Wilson once said is like so the, the place or, or the, the, his language is like a, like, like a stone. So and you can put it everywhere, it works everywhere. So, <laughs> and yeah, I, I like that picture. So, and, uh, but I think so there's, there, it, it's very strong and, and, and people give attention to it in Germany. But on the other way, you see for sure that very young people, so in school, so, they do not learn anymore a language which is in, wie sagt man, in Reimen. In, in rhyme. In rhymes. Right. So, and, uh, and for sure it needs education to understand the place. So there's a rhythm for sure, but it needs education. And education is not at the moment what people really get somewhere. Uh, in, in, so it's getting less in Germany too. And so um, that makes me sometimes um, thinking what, what there will be in the future. On the other side is like so many people who then are really interested in the work and they really live in it and they see like, uh, they see an option out of capitalistic system in the text, which is really important. And uh, yeah, so, so it lives on and I'm, I'm happy that it lives on. And I think it, um, it's, uh, it, it will get more important the next years, even also with the situation in Germany. So I can imagine that because that what we had now, what I said that that retained revolution. So now we have the process going on. It's the same people who were demonstrating '89. We are one folk, yeah. And now they, it's all right-wing people. So it's, but it's the same people. So and. Uh, there will be some big conflicts, I, I guess, in the next years. No. Um, and a question to you, how, how does it feel for you to read the text of your father in New York, and um, how, do you, how do you relate to them? Well, it was my first reading in English, so um, <laughs> very different. Well I mean, done, I'm, well I'm not that used to his text in English, of course. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult because the rhythm is, is very different. Uh, and I'm kind of used to the rhythm already. We do a lot of readings now and um, no, but still, um, I think for me myself, I was, uh, for a long time, I was kind of scared uh, to read his plays and, and to read his texts because I was scared I wouldn't understand them. And I guess at some point I just thought maybe understanding is not the most important part also. <laughs> and what actually really helped me is to read all of the interviews with him because um, it's a very different way to get to know him and to also understand his place. And I do think that they're in, in our time now more actual, do you say actual? Not really, current, yeah, more current than ever, yeah. Maybe a question to both Jonathan and Bonnie, maybe with you first. What comes to your mind when you heard Brigitte talk about uh, Heiner's work? I was thinking how um, so many of the themes, the political themes, um, the concept of history and also utopia and, and, the, and its opposite, dystopia, seem so um, current today, especially the way that people are, are having a, a lack of confidence in democracy and talking of, even in this country about socialism. And it seems like the, the certain political dynamic, it, it's very, um, it's very uh, current now, very true. But I was thinking of something else too. It seemed to me, and I know that I, I either wrote, um, mentioned this to Heiner or else I wrote about it somewhere, that, um, that um, it, there's a strong dimension in Heiner's, uh, Heiner Miller's work about the future belonging to women. 
but the problem for me always with the stagings, and, and I re recall, you know, the Hamlet machine very well and going to the rehearsals and actually, you know, telling Bob this, Bob Wilson, that th there was a strength of characters, and Heiner wrote extremely strong women, some of the strongest since Greek drama or the Duchess of Malfi, but they didn't have the, they, did, they refused to stage them with that strength. They remained strong in the text. But often the existential part, like say with Hamlet, I'll give you an example. Uh, with Hamlet Machine, Hamlet's existential crisis was staged downstage in the front. But Ophelia's speeches, and they are some of the so, so strong, her speeches, and that has to do with the future of women, they were staged further upstage. And I remember uh, going to rehearsal, and Bob Wilson asked me what I thought. And I said, I told him exactly that. And that's what I feel, that the strength of the women didn't always come out um, in the performances, but they were there in the text. And I, I feel that Heiner thought about the future of the world being attached to women. Uh, I don't know, do, do, you, do you feel the same? Definitely, I'm actually planning a book on that. Yeah, she's just planning a book on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there. <laughs> so I totally agree. Um, Jonas, the same question to you. Um, hearing from both, and especially from Brigitte's talks. Um, what are you? Um, I, I, loved, I loved your, your talk and your presentation. It was, it was very um, special for me, I thought. Uh, uh, the, um, I, I love that you brought in clips from productions, because Heiner's work doesn't just live on the page. You have to kind of see it living in the theater. Um, when, when you think about the presence of Heiner Müller, you think about the way that he kind of took the German theater by storm in the 1980s and 90s. Um, it's hard to explain to people today what his presence was. Um, uh, he, he was just everywhere in the German landscape. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think if there even could be a, a figure in the American culture who would be equivalent. I don't think so because what you see in these clips is how much the theater itself means to the German people. Um, Andre Wirth, uh, our, our, our common friend who just died once, uh, he enjoyed saying that good or bad, the Germans take their theater seriously. Uh, they just go. It's, it's one of their means uh, to talk to themselves about themselves, and they go. It's not that they always love it or like it. It's that someone like Heiner Müller appears on their landscape and he is so uh, wonderfully self-taught uh, and he's reinventing the theater through texts that challenge the theater to go beyond what it has done before. And they just, they just go. They go because they enjoy talking to themselves about hating it or loving it. Um, and and it, it continues to this day with a few dips, but now it's coming back. Uh, who would that be in the American landscape? You know, it would be, uh, it would never be a playwright, first of all, yeah. because we don't think about the theater that way. Uh, but it would be someone who uh, uh, was able to speak to us about uh, what is going on in our culture deeply in a very pithy, aphoristic way to be quoted all the time uh, on uh, public issues um, and then to have premieres every couple of years about important new plays. I don't know that we have that here. Uh, and so it's something that we watch and sort of envy about the German landscape. If, if Susan Sontag would have written plays that had the same reception, perhaps she might have been um, uh, someone like this. But what will be um, 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 the future? I mean, we all think about what, what this will be, his legacy be in a way as you also said people do not think anymore in structure of Greek dramas. They might not even know the names. They don't understand that special situation uh, of East Germany and West Germany being a, a writer in the East of tragedy where the audience was able to read between the lines, which has been gone. And even I know that I can't write anymore. So what do you all think? Where, where, where lies the significance? What is the point of entry for new audiences? I, I do want to say interviews again. So the interviews is one thing. Because uh, not that many people also know them all. No, so a big part of his no, work. Yeah, did, a big okay, part what, of his work. What we definitely. did is like we, uh, one year ago, we edited a book at Surkamp. Two called years ago now, to be two honest. Two years ago now already, yeah. It's not enough for everyone. 
And it's, uh, let's say, Heiner Müller for beginners. Yeah. So it's some interviews, some pieces of important plays, prose, lyrics, so just to, to meet him. Yeah. And that is already so, it's already printed the third time now. It, it works good. So, and the thing is, uh, you can think a lot, but I think, so my, my thing, I'm more practical woman, so, and um, what I plan also with Anna, we want to make a school book for Heine. And so we're just still thinking how we can do it. I mean, we've already worked on three plays. Yeah, we are, so she already worked with three plays, and the idea was that, uh, so we have some, so we know a lot of actors who are always like, we call them and they come and read for us, so, and we were thinking to make a tour with schools, just to bring that kind of text to the people, so, and where should, where else should you start then at a school, so that's one of our ideas just to, to keep the work alive. And for sure, I mean, for sure now what we plan is um, more to bring him more in a digital century. So, and uh, so and there is now a new website on and it's done by MDR. It's kind of a, uh, it's TV and, and, and radio thing, German state thing. The Müller Baukast. The Müller Baukasten, and it's really like, uh, you can get lost in this. It's like you made one point, you have one quote, and they go your desk, and then see your dad, and that's you really can lose yourself. And it's like a big mind map, maybe. It's a big mind map of, of, of Müller, and I mean, it's still a good country, people producing things like that, because it's a lot of work, and it does not bring money in the first time, and so things like that happen, and so, and we want to do more like... Um, also, we do more readings now, which is very important. We, do we more kind readings. of forgot about that for yeah. years. So, which is, uh, which we, we enjoy it now. Yeah, <laughs> already, yeah. yeah. I do, at least, very much. I do at least very much. So readings of his uh, uh, plays or readings of uh, the yeah, interviews readings. or um both, both everything yeah. excerpts yeah. of so everything. People else. ask and and we come and then we make a program. Yeah. So with and actors without actors. Yeah. Mixed. <laughs> yeah. I mean just the um uh Umsilb auf Lande just opened there's this play is there are there more plays out in German landscapes uh, at the moment in theater again about Heiner Müller or his plays, or is it the same or more or less? So, yeah, I mean, it's it's what I what I already said. It's like always the same level. It could be more, but should not be less. So, uh, but what what there is new that that people make they don't make any more one play. So people make collage. So they take like a bit Shakespeare, a bit Müller, or a bit I don't know. And first, we were not thinking that this is so good, but I mean, if someone is really intelligent and is really good in his work, it comes back to Heiner's idea of material. So, and so, and especially for sure, Castor, for example, he makes like that seven, eight hours uh, uh, stagings and mostly one hour is Müller. So, <laughs> so, and uh, so you have a lot of that things that t to be a play in the play. And um, yeah, and what I said, it's the Shakespeare adaptions, but what very often is coming is Philoctet, which is interesting for me. So, because it's not the easiest one. And then we have like quartet, auftrag, so on. But uh, also people make collage of the prose, Mommsen's block or so, things like that. Yeah. Jonathan, what do you think? What it will be is in the U.S. also? What is his, or could it be? Uh, actually, uh, I wrote um, an essay on Heiner Müller in uh, the American stage for a, a handbook whose publication has been delayed. These Heiner Müller scholars, Janine Ludwig and uh, Florian Becker, you probably know them. Um, so um, I did some research on this, and I, I, I discovered things that surprised me. Um, I, uh, with with uh, Janine, I, I tried to track down some statistics on Heiner Müller in the United States, and I found uh, 162 productions of Müller between 1975 and 2017. That's more than three times as many productions as we had of Brecht in this country. 
It's remarkable. Um, it's, uh, the vast majority of them were in New York, uh, but that doesn't matter. There are, um, there, what, what it showed me is that there was a, uh, a real significant wave of Heiner Müller uh, devotion here in the States too. And I'm, I'm quite sure that most of these productions did not apply for the rights either because I asked the publishers whether, how many contracts they had. And so this was this was real sleuthing trying we to find. We look into that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, they have the same thing in China, for example. It's the same, so. Yeah, <laughs> but, but but still, I, you know, most of these theaters they have taken Heiner and done what they want with him, which is what he would have wanted. There's this uh, a, a theater in L.A. called City Garage, which did. Um, uh, 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 not Lessing's dream of sleep, but this was during George Bush's, it was George W's dream of sleep, yeah. you know? Uh, they did Landscape with Argonauts and it was all about LA. Uh, and that's exactly what he would have wanted for them to take it and make it into something of their own. So I think although we're in a kind of an ice age right now with Heiner, uh, not very many productions, I'm 100% sure that there will come a time, I don't know when, when people will need him again and they will reach for him and it will come back. I don't know how much it will come back or whether we could call it a vogue, um, but he's just too significant and important a writer to just stay buried for a long time. But in the United States, almost everything is neglected. Everything of value in the dramatic canon is neglected. So it's not like he has a special status here. But, but. You know, one, one of the things I would say though is that uh, We've had uh, at, at PAJ Publications, Hammer Machine and other texts for the stage in print since the 80s, and it continues to sell hundreds of copies a year. So it means that it's very steadily in the curriculum. Um, that play is also anthologized in a lot of um, contemporary drama books. So there are, there are three volumes of plays, four volumes of Heiner Müller's works in print. Uh, there had been a Heiner Müller reader, which um, sold out. Um, I'm hoping to do something, I'm not sure exactly what, um, in the fall issue. And one of the things I was curious that you mentioned Tintoretto because I have a, an essay by Etel Adnan who, with whom he worked on the, the French part of the Civil Wars, Wilson's production. And she wrote about Heine Müller and Tintoretto, an essay which I just have to have translated into French. And I thought that would be very interesting because of Heiner's, um, uh, the anniversary of his death in Tintoretto's 500 years in, in, in uh, 2019. So uh, I, I want to do something unusual. I don't know what, I don't know what material is around in, in English. And, I'm, and, I, I, and we don't handle the performance rights, so I don't know what, um, what rights might be coming up. But, you know, to go back to your point, Jonathan, I think it would take almost something like uh, Ivo von Hobler, would, you know, to do a Heine Müller play or something to get a really big production and a lot of attention again. Um, so, some, some really. Well, yeah, I think it should directed. be said that the back to back events of your publication of the Hamlet Machine volume and Bob Wilson's Hamlet Machine production in 84 and 86, this is what launched that sort of Heiner Müller wave in the States. Yeah. It, it came you know, from those two initial. So we need events. another big, a big commercial, not commercial, but I mean a big production on a big scale that a lot of people see and mm. wake up to that. And he's one director who would come to mind because of the, you know, his politics. Yeah. But it would take something like that. We really sorely need um, you know, m more Heine Miller productions or even just one, <coughs> one really important well, staging. Our hope is to engage the Wooster Group. You know, we have been in contact with her. So hopefully, you're going to meet with them in Berlin. They engage with Kanter's work, with Foresight, I think also Kortalski. So that, mm -hmm. I think, would be a significant contribution, yeah. and everybody, I think, would come and yeah. go. But uh, Brigitte or uh, Anna, I, I know there was the Gorky production of, uh, I think, the Hamlet Machine. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it, but I heard a lot about it. But can you tell us a little bit about, I think, the Exile Ensemble? Did it, what, what, firstly, about that ensemble, what they do, but also what that, what did you think of that production? But describe it a little bit, what they did. Okay, um, we didn't love it. <laughs> we didn't love it. <laughs> okay. No, the thing is, the thing is It was successful, that, no, no, it was successful. Yeah, it's, it's very successful. It's not about, you know, it's, it's, it's not all about success, you know. The thing is that this, the, in, in theoretical, that was a big thing, the theory. Like to, to have Hamlet machine and 
to put it as a, a transition paper on, on migration. It absolutely works. And a friend of, and a, a one, I have a good friend who was the leader of the Exile Ensemble who left it after that production. That's um, Ayam, and um, Ayam Madrid Agda, so Syrian guy. And so the thing was that it was just aesthetically not good done. It was like a, a theater, a school theater. It was like just, it was the big idea, but a yeah. big idea had no, had no expression in art. You know? The, the Excel Ensemble is like refugees and, um, and uh, people yeah, yeah, it's like, who it's, it's do enough. theater at the Gorky. The thing is enough, it's a refugee theme, so uh, it's good. But it's not what I am wanted and, and also not what we see. So it's Gorky is, is a, I mean, is a high class theater. Mm -hmm. So they can't do like that. They can't act like that. So, but it wasn't I mean, that bad. So, hmm? it what wasn't that bad. What did you think about it? No, I mean, it, 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 it was a fun evening. Yeah, I so. Um, I mean, the thing is with Gorky, always, um, I do think that it's important that it's a fun evening for everyone and people are coming and, and they like it, you know. In the end, it doesn't really matter if I like it or not, you know. Um, so I'm always grateful for every production at Gorky, even if I don't 100% completely agree with it because I know that they have a lot of young people coming there. Um, people are very interested. And it's a very different vibe than, for example, at Berlin Ensemble or at oh, the Volksbühne now. Isn't, it, isn't yeah. it led by a woman? And it's also led by a woman, which is definitely part of that. Yeah, it's, of even, it's even a Turkish woman. So, yeah. I mean, she came like when she was small to Germany and that is really so she's the first Turkish woman to lead a theater ever in Germany, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, she, she does, does an a, amazing job. She does a job. great job. Yeah. Yeah, we have really she's there actually coming. She's coming. Yeah, she's so our panel here, right? voices. No. We're going to show six plays. Yeah. No, no, uh, she's a Gorky, a and she's going to come Kurdish and talk fighter. about. Yeah, <laughs> um, um, yeah. Um, I really love her. Yeah. Will um, the Arturo Hui production remain in the Berlin Ensemble under the new leadership? Yeah, it's still there. The Arturo. Um, That's a great production. Yeah, it's. I have problems with that production. It's a great it. I art. Love it. She loves it. So, but I knew the story, and I, I knew that Heiner did not want to do it. She was like forced to do it because it needed to have a success, and for sure. And then the financial director said, "Oh, let's do something about Hitler, the most loved statesman of the 20th century." So yeah, let's do Arturo. Oh, people will come, and it was like that. So. And People are still coming. So it might, sure, I mean, it's sold out every time, and it's yeah. been. So and I think three hundred shows now. It's more. I think even five hundred. Five hundred. Oh yeah, yeah. I think yeah. five hundred. No, I mean it's it's a it's a big it's a good e production also from 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 the form and everything. But for me, it's always the thing that I knew how hard for him it was to do it because he wanted to do his own place. So and. Uh, can, yeah. can I just say that Heiner said something similar about his quartet with Mariana Hoppe to me, he, he, I, which I loved. And I tell, I tell him that I love this production, and he says, blah, you know, <laughs> yeah, because it's a hit. You know, that means to him it was, it meant to him it was evidence that it was, blah, blah, you know, it was popular. He just couldn't stand it. And I, so what am I supposed to say, that I didn't like it? I liked it. But he I probably would have liked no, it. No, Did I say it. No, I mean, if, if I wouldn't have been uh, like so near to Heiner, I would have liked all three productions, not, not the thing. But I know that also it already started with Quartet. And you know, Marianne Hopper, she was not that easy. So every morning, every morning at seven o'clock in the morning, she called. So, and, uh, and I was on the phone and I said, oh, Heiner, seriously, I want to talk to Heiner. So, and that was really like, she made us all Crazy, crazy. <laughs> yeah. well, so. but what I have to say about the Arturo Ui, though, is that for me, it's a play where I can take people that are not familiar with theater, mm. or even people that say, I never do theater, I don't like theater, yeah. and I can take them there, and they're going to love it, and they're going to rethink um, their perception of theater, which I like. Um, what about the international reception beyond the US, let's say Brazil, um, South Africa, or um, you did mention China. I'm sure you hear of 
um, the request. So how, how is it and how are translation? Is the entire uh, catalog of it translated? How is that, how, what's happening? Uh, okay, so there's, uh, there's some, let's say, kind of control for South America. There's a lot of things which are also with contract, everything, but in China, I, I have, uh, someone sends me a photo, oh, there's a production of Heine, and I thought, oh, maybe you, you can ask for a translation, I would be interested, <laughs> so, so there is not an official thing in China. So people translate, play, mostly we don't know it. So and uh, but there is a lot of things in Frank in 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 Frankreich in France going on, and uh, yeah. So but mostly South America is strong. Yeah. In what country in South America is it? It's mostly Brazil. Yeah. Good. Maybe we open it up, Michael. If you could put a bit of light to the audience, and um, so if we have um, some questions. Um, or, or just remarks or a statement, and maybe shortly say who you are, and um, you have a chance to uh, ask Brigitte or Anna, Jonathan, or Bonnie. So, Hello. is it on? Is it clicked on? Yeah. Is it no, we can hear you very good. So. <laughs> but we're stream, uh, streaming it. So okay, now yeah, we got it. Okay. Need to reset. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and I'm a student here at the Graduate Center. Um, I was wondering, you know, I, I heard and came across in my research about this production that um, Heiner directed um, as the Berlin Wall was coming down um, of Hamlet and Hamlet Machine together. And the, the references that I came across were vague, but in this ongoing conversation of, of mixing together the classics and, and his own interpretations, I, I wondered if any of you had insights about what that was like or the motivations for, for doing it. Uh, okay, I, I think that Heiner was, so he always said, I'm not interested like only in the current time capsule. So for him it was always important to have like uh, a yesterday, a today, and a tomorrow. So, and that what I said is one thing is rewriting mythological pieces, historic pieces, like rewriting in, in adding, for example, at Macbeth, the peasant, peasant, peasants, so, and yeah. peasants, peasants, bauern, yeah. And uh, so, and also like, um, so some, Heiner was someone who was like, we can say connected to a kind of destiny, to a kind of mythology, to a kind of, I don't know, but he was connected to something. So, and I think he took that connect connection very serious. So, and so he also wrote himself and his time in a bigger context, into a bigger context. So I think that was uh, one of the motivation. And he lived in a very big room. So that was like the feeling when, when, when he died, I had the feeling that the sky is coming on my head down, you know, because that room was lost in that moment. And I had really to, hard to work to get it for myself a bigger room again so because you you lived in that temple of him of his head so and he had a tremendous remembering of everything you know so you ask something and he knew it he, he, everything he was reading he, he he kept so and he knew so much things which was for me like yeah a universe um, so and i think that he, that he lived in that big universe and that meant that he is to live with other dead persons, uh, with, with dead persons. So he, he had the, like one of the last uh, notes he left in his um, working room before he died is, um, you, have to, you, you will have to learn to live without me, just learn, uh, alone with the other dead people in the library. So, around this, yeah. Uh, I, can I just say that that was an extraordinary event, Hamlet, Hamlet Machine. It was in rehearsal when all of the um, uh, uh, sudden events of the fall of 1989, you know, were, were in play. And uh, it changed because uh, the rehearsals were going on while the politics were suddenly budging that had been frozen for so long. And it just is this extraordinary coincidence that, that, that this, this um, 
uh, author who had uh, done this extraordinary a adaptation, you could say, of what we call our greatest play, Hamlet, ha Hamlet Machine, happened to be working on this at that time and thinking of it as uh, a drama of the um, uh, absolute impasse for the intellectual in the face of frozen history. Uh, and, and so there's a film, there's a wonderful film about that. Uh, it's, it's by Christoph Rüter. It's called The Time is Out of Joint. Mm -hmm. It's all uh, about um, the way that rehearsals were infused with the politics of the moment and how everything got colored with reality. Uh, it was eight hours long, and it was just an extraordinary experience, as I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it was great. I, I saw that. I just wanted to say something about what you, what you said about um, history. Um, if I recall, Heiner's thought that we hadn't yet come to history, that this was all prehistory. And he always said that there are many more dead than living. Yeah. Uh, but I believe that he felt we did not attain history. I don't remember exactly his, the, ra the reasoning for that, but he felt we were still living in prehistory. Um, yeah, that, uh, that just came to, to, to mind when you, when you talked about that. Um, I also w just wanted to tell you that I wrote a little poem, which was one of his last poems. It's in the Heine Miller Reader. It's called Empty Time. He wrote a few poems and things in the last few years. Um, and this says, my shadow of yesterday has been burnt by the sun in a tiresome April. Dust on the books, at night the clocks run faster. No wind from the sea, waiting for nothing. It's called Empty Time. Thank you. And I think he was in New York, right, when the wall actually- He was in New York when the wall actually- Actually came down, it was yeah. some kind of an interview with a late night local cable station. We showed, I think, um, um, that clip, the film also from Christoph. No, no, you know what it, what it was, because uh, I was with him that time. He came to New York with Heiner Goebbels. They the were menu. doing at the kitchen, The Man in the Elevator, which yep. is a part of, um, uh, uh, golf tribe. The, the, what was it? The, tra the task? The task? Or the mission? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, he was here mission. for the but actually the moment when he heard it, he was in a strange TV show, and I think Christoph has it in his, in his uh, documentary. Yeah. yeah, I think he came like two nights after. I forget, I have to look up the date. But this show, this piece, was at the kitchen, um, and I remember him sitting at the table, and he said, I, I'm in shock. I never thought this would happen. But there were very famous jazz musicians who were playing with him. Don Cherry, um, I think it's the subject of the Green Book, right? That film now. Oh, uh, that that was him. Arto okay. Lindsay, and and Heiner Goebbels, and um, yeah, they came to New York like a, a day or two after uh, the wall had fell. At it was a Goebbels put a Heiner Goebbels production. Yeah. Heiner, Heiner Goebbels. Uh, it was a kind of. And he was reading at a. He was Heiner was reading at the table, yeah, reading the, the table. text, and it was a kind of a music piece. Music. Yeah. It was a, an extraordinary time for him, um, as I'm sure Brigitte uh, knows better than anybody. The, he, he, uh, the, the, he responded to the fall of the wall with a combination of fascination and panic and, uh, uh, and, and analysis. Um, and um, uh, he gave these interviews at the time that were published as books that were so penetrating. One was called uh, Zur Lage der Nation, the other was called Jenseits der Nation. They were never published in English, but they were the most extraordinary, um, uh, just, um, uh, just penetrating uh, analyses of what was going on in the world, what was really moving suddenly, like a glacier falling off uh, the edge of a coast. And, um, and then he looked inside himself and asked about why, why am I not writing plays anymore? And he, he was writing poetry, and his poetry was more personal than it had been in a long time. Uh, he, there's one uh, line I remember of his uh, when the GDR, uh, the Germans voted the GDR out of existence, you know, his, his, his home country. He said, um, gone is the power against which my verse broke like waves. Rainbow colored. Do you remember that line? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I can, I can tell you the whole one in German. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, say, say. What's uh, yeah, no, okay. Probably. <laughs> but the microphone. Yeah, that, no, I have, to, I have to, because I was reading it in the last uh, thing. Um, yeah. Um, 
Die Masken sind verbraucht. Fin de partie. Oh, ich krieg's nicht mehr hin. Die Masken sind verbraucht. Fin de partie. Zerstoben ist der Vers. Zerstoben ist die Macht, an der mein Vers sich brach. Regenbogenfarb. Willkommen in Vokuta, Kommissar. Statt Mauern stehen Spiegel um mich her. Mein Blick sucht mein Gesicht, das Glas bleibt leer. So instead of walls, mirrors stand around me and I try to find my face, but the mirror stays empty. So that's how it ends. Yeah, yeah he, he did say, if I remember, that tragedies you know, are for kind of dictatorships. That's where these uh, tragedies work in capitalism. You can only write comedy and he said, I'm not a comedy writer, he said you can't, you know, it's not the form um, he was um, um, attuned to. But another uh, the thought, or oh, yeah, Raphael. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the speech, and it was amazing to hear you. And, uh, and I will point out that a question that you uh, uh, rose about the, the, the Heine Miller, how, how he is important. I remember that wha when I was a student in Brazil, uh, we didn't uh, uh, learn so much about Miller because my, t my teacher, wow, it's so German, we need to find a, a way to Brazil to express our theater, and that, that kind of things. But right now, we are dealing in, in Brazil with a, a political situation, the, the stream right rising right now. And I, and, and I saw a, a play of Heine Miller two years ago in a huge festival in Brazil, at the Mission, they called the Mission and 12 Fragments. And the, the cast were, uh, there, was, there were all black people and they are dealing with decolonization in the body of the, the that black, black uh, actors, and and they use uh, the, the the words of uh, of Heine Miller as a stone, but not to put somewhere, but to throw and to throw it in the in the ground, and, and it's a metaphor, uh, of course, but they use Heine Miller as a, uh, the, uh, as a political subject to deal with the rise of the extreme uh, right in Brazil. And I think it's a kind of uh, appearance of Miller in another culture, because it's Brazil, it's, uh, I think Heinz Miller some, some, somewhere it's told, uh, it's a kind of Brazil and South America, it's an island of, uh, I don't know, I, I forgot the metaphor, but it, it's, a, it's an island of a disorder that the new could come. Uh, and some, so I, 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 I just, I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, but uh, I would like to to do to to make this comment because uh, I, of course he is uh, he is important. Of course he he could brought something uh, to deal with this situation, and I think it's not just in Brazil, but uh, maybe in, in in U.S. or somewhere else. And and uh, I would just like to to bring this comment, and uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Something else, um, a thought or a question? Uh, maybe then we come close to the evening, but maybe tell us both of you what are your projects you're working on at the moment and what, oh, perhaps if you, someone would give you a million dollar, whatever, what would you do to uh, have the- Another million and do more. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, so I would do a movie. <laughs> So, yeah, so we, different things. So she has her projects, I have mine, so, and some things we do together, but so one thing what I already told is like uh, a new edition of his works with manuscripts, so, and for this we meet like 18, 18th of May, we meet 18 Müller experts in Kreuzberg to start that uh, edition, like just like a kickoff for that idea. So, and uh, that's one thing, but we, we need to make the money and bring the money and all those things. And uh, yeah, that's one thing. And then, um, so we have like that readings, which is like going on. And uh, so then there's books with Surkamp, is like Müller in America from Frank Radatz which should be finished, I hope, next year, so. And uh, so Anna is... Uh, I'm planning the book about the strong women figures, actually, yes. Yeah. And um, also I'm planning a documentary. 
yeah, I mean, interviews mostly. It's, uh, it's really at the total beginning, um, but I've met with some production companies and I'm kind of trying to, um, me for myself, I call it kind of having a, having a hobby with my father. <laughs> kind of getting to know him because I was three when he died. So it would be interesting for me to, to really have it as me exploring who my father is to uh, his friends and colleagues and people that lived with him. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the time testimonies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what it is. So we have to do it now, or she has to do it now, because people just are very old and dying. So, and uh, it's the time now to catch up the people who knew him and worked with him. So that's one thing. And yeah. in the end, I would love to have a real movie. I mean, like a next step. Like about his life, yeah. not a documentary. Yeah. No, I mean maybe even a mini series that would be actually <laughs> my favorite version. Yeah, mini series. Yeah. Like, no, yeah, I mean, like yeah, like a hundred years of Germany, a hundred years of Anna Müller, yeah. three systems. Yeah. You know, you so. could do it chronologically. It would work. Yeah. And so if you find that million, let me know. Yeah, we will. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you never know. You never, you never know. know. So maybe Anna, we could ask you to <coughs> read uh, an excerpt of the Hamlet machine. I yes. think you selected uh, a piece, and this will be then the end of the evening. We're going to have a little reception here in the room, but um, wait a second. I'm looking for one page. I mean, it's fine, I can do this part too. All good. Okay, Hamlet Machine, 1977. Television, the daily disgust, disgust at prepared nonsense, at official cheerfulness. How do you spell Gemütlichkeit? Give us this day our daily murder, for yours is the void. Disgust at the lies that are believed by the liars and no one else. Disgust at the lies that are believed. Disgust at the faces of the machas lined by the struggle for positions, votes, dollars. Disgust a scythe chariot with flashing points. I pass through the streets, malls, faces, scarred by the battle for consumption, poverty without dignity, poverty without the dignity of the knife, the brass knuckles, the fist, the humiliated bodies of the women, hope of the generation suffocated in blood, cowardly stupidity, laughter from dead bellies. Heil Coca-Cola, a kingdom for a murderer. I was Macbeth, the king has offered me his third concubine. I knew every word on her hips. Raskolnikov, in my heart, under my only jacket, the hatchet for the only skull of the pawnbroker. In the loneliness of the airports, I take a deep breath. I am privileged. My disgust is a privilege, screened by the wall, barbed wire prison. Photograph of the author. I no longer want to eat. Drink, breathe, love a woman, a man, a child, an animal. I no longer want to die. I no longer want to kill. The photograph of the author is torn up. I break open my sealed flesh. I want to live in my veins, in the marrow of my bones, in the labyrinth of my skull. I withdraw into my intestines. I sit down in my shit, my blood. Somewhere bodies are being broken so I can live in my shit. Somewhere bodies are being opened up so I can be alone with my blood. Tomorrow, so uh, they really came in for us here. So yeah, we're leaving tomorrow. tomorrow. So thank you.